Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Maternity and Myositis webinar presented by the Myositis Association Women of Color Affinity Group. My name is Holly Jones, and I will be your moderator for this evening. Starting off, I would like to introduce to you Dr. Edens. Dr. Edens is an adult and pediatric rheumatologist at the University of Chicago. Her clinical and research concentration lies in the interplay between fertility, pregnancy, sexual health, contraceptive, and rheumatic diseases across the ages, but particularly in teens and young adults with rheumatic diseases. She is involved in the American College of Rheumatology Reproductive Health Initiative and the co-leader of the Childhood Arthritis and Rheumatology Research Alliance Reproductive Health Work Group. Please welcome Dr. Edens. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here and present this topic um, that I definitely feel very passionate about. Um, so we will get going. Let's see if I can see it. Is that sharing the correct screen? I don't think that it is. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. All right. Um, it's not showing in presenter mode in my side, though. That is the problem. All right. That is okay. Um, so we're going to talk about myositis and different reproductive health topics um, uh, that uh, uh, we'll cover. Um, as Holly said, um, I'm uh, oops, sorry at University of Chicago, um, where I'm an adult and pediatric rheumatologist. Um, so pregnancy and rheumatic disease is a little bit challenging in general to study. Um, as we know, there's lots of different rheumatic diseases, and today we're going to focus on myositis. But it's really challenging uh, to study rare diseases. Um, and uh, rare diseases um, in pregnancy even more so because there's so many different variables that are around. And at the same time, things have actually changed historically, um, where we used to tell women with rheumatic diseases not to get pregnant, that they shouldn't get pregnant. Um, and now we're um, you know, welcoming pregnancies um, uh, with you know, support and guidance. Um, and so there's a lot of nuances that have kind of historically changed. Uh, myositis itself, though, is a little bit hard to study because myositis is a very broad term. Um, as you in the audience knows, myositis can mean a lot of different things and involve um, a lot of different muscle groups. Um, it can have different organ involvement. Um, and so um, it makes it really challenging to study myositis. Is very similar to our other diseases like lupus. Someone can have very mild lupus and someone can have very severe lupus. And somehow you're trying to compare the um, outcomes of uh, those two pregnancies and somehow um, kind of make some conclusions. And that can really be um, challenging. Um, often, unfortunately, patients with rheumatic diseases are excluded from studies in general. Um, so even if we think about the most recent studies that we're all kind of more familiar with, like the COVID vaccine, um, rheumatic disease patients were excluded from the original trials of COVID vaccines. Um, and so um, unfortunately, that because um, rheumatic diseases are excluded, then also there's just less research and less numbers to work with. Um, and then to counter that also, um, the FDA doesn't conduct studies on pregnant women either. So then we also run into a problem where things like medications um, or vaccines as well um, aren't tested in pregnant women. And so we also have a delay in getting that information out. So you can see that there's a lot of different barriers of trying to study a pregnancy and rheumatic diseases, as especially myositis. Um, it's also important to know that every um, but three to five percent of birth defects um, uh, happen in all women, no matter what medications they are in, no matter what um, uh, underlying diagnoses they may have. As like a very general um, kind of. Uh, uh, statistic across um, populations. And that's actually been constant for a very long time. It really hasn't changed. Um, even though we get new medicines and find new diseases, um, that number actually hasn't changed. And I think it's always important to remember that one in four women does have a miscarriage. Um, and so uh, uh, although it may be higher in rheumatic diseases, um, but they're still quite common in the general population. Um, so 
Um, so pregnancy planning is really key. Um, so pram pregnancies have better outcomes for mom and baby. And so what are better outcomes? So um, less miscarriage and stillbirth, um, things like uh, less preeclampsia, um, having less preterm labor and premature infants, um, having uh, babies not stay in the neonatal intensive care unit uh, or stay less time. And then to me, the whole goal of pregnancy planning and why it's so important is because my goal is always to have a mom and a baby go home and are healthy. Um, and to, I want that to be like the thing that happens for most of my patients and, you know, as many as I can make successful um, pregnancies. So that's to me why pregnancy is, uh, pregnancy planning is really, really important to try to decrease all of these um, outcomes um, that can have negative um, uh, outcomes for everyone. Um, so as a patient, um, what if I'm thinking about becoming pregnant, right? So where do I even start? Um, so really talking to your medical team is uh, the first thing that you should do, in my opinion, um, aside from probably talking with perhaps the person that you are interested um, in uh, having a child with, or if you're going to do it on your own, then that's also an option. Um, so talking with everybody, right? So that includes your primary care doctor, establishing care with an uh, obstetrician, talking with your rheumatologist. Um, a lot of you may have other subspecialists that you see. So like a pulmonologist, cardiologist, nephrologist, neurologist, to me, everybody needs to be aware that you are considering getting pregnant. So everybody can weigh in and all the kinks can be worked out and the pregnancy can be planned. Um, and so hopefully the um, hurdles in the road won't happen during your pregnancy. Um, I think it's also really important to think about establishing with a high-risk OB. Um, they're also in some places called maternal fetal medicine doctors or MFM. Um, and so those are obstetricians who've done extra training um, in high-risk pregnancies. Um, and so they are more comfortable with medications, with someone who's just not, um, you know, just someone who doesn't have any other diagnoses and who doesn't take any other medicines um, who gets pregnant. Um, they do what's called preconception consultations. Um, and so I think that's really an important thing to do is to meet with this person um, or group, sometimes it's a group of them, um, and kind of discuss your specific medications, um, your different risk factors. Um, and uh, I, I would personally would ask them how many patients they've seen before with myositis um, to see if, if they have any experience. Um, you could also ask a rheumatologist something similar, like how many pregnant patients have they had with myositis just to gauge. Um, but as we know, myositis is rare and myositis in pregnancy is even more rare. So you shouldn't necessarily run from someone who hasn't done that, but I think it would just be um, uh, interesting to get their input. Um, so to me, everybody should be discussed with, hey, you know what, I talked, we're ready. Um, you know, is, is this also an okay time for me to get pregnant? Um, but why do I need to talk to all of them? So assessing for risk is really important. Um, also assessing for disease activity. Um, we'll talk about the risks uh, a little bit more in a second on the next slide. Um, so assessing for disease activity is really important because we know that the best time for actually across all rheumatic diseases, but especially in myositis, that the best time to get pregnant is when your disease is not active. So when you're in remission or really as close to as you can get. Um, it's also really important to assess medication safety, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about medicines as well in the next couple of slides, but there's some medicines that need to be stopped before you get pregnant. Um, there's some that you can definitely continue safely um, throughout pregnancy, um, and so I think it's really important um, to know that out front and not have any other scares or concerns, um, and again, it's why planning is so important. Um, but there's also really important reasons to talk to all of your doctors, not just your rheumatologist or your subspecialist, because there's other things that we do to prepare women for pregnancy. Um, we talk about, you know, what about your, is there issues with your health insurance? You know, are you in a stable place in your life? Um, are you safe at home? Are there like domestic violence issues or other kind of external factors that we need to make sure we, we want you to be like the safest place um, to, to be pregnant? Um, some people do things like drink alcohol or smoke tobacco or use other illicit products. Um, and so we want to make sure also to counsel on those sort of things. Um, also, if someone's thinking about getting pregnant. Um, the recommendations are actually to start a prenatal vitamin. And actually, most women um, who are of childbearing age are recommended to already be taking a prenatal vitamin. Um, so, uh, but certainly if you're planning your pregnancy, you can certainly start that before you actually get pregnant. 
Um, there is some recommendations out there about addressing weight um, before women consider getting pregnant. Um, I personally am someone who doesn't um, really focus a lot on patients' weight, um, but there are some studies that if patients lose weight, it actually increases their risk, or, sorry, decreases their risk and increases their risk of uh, pregnancy success. Um, so I think those are just uh, some things to think about that other um, medical providers um, might talk to you about. Um, so in terms of the risks, um, so there are some reasons why women with rheumatic diseases should consider not getting pregnant. And some of this may be like not getting pregnant ever, which I know is an unfortunate thing that some people never want to hear. Um, but I think uh, this is why, again, you need uh, to talk to your doctors about pregnancy planning and have that pre-conception uh, consultation and really make sure that everybody's on the same page. Um, so um, here's a list of some of the um, uh, diagnoses and kind of other physical findings or disease characteristics um, that kind of make us think that maybe we should talk to a patient about their pregnancy risk and that their risk may actually be too significant um, to to recommend pregnancy. Um, so patients with pulmonary hypertension, um, so that's when the blood pressure in the heart uh, between the heart and the lungs is really high. Um, it can be from some of our connective tissue diseases um, like myositis or scleroderma or lupus. Um, sometimes it can also be because someone has um, something like interstitial lung disease um, and so that can cause high blood pressure as well. Um, so unfortunately patients with pulmonary hypertension have a really hard time in pregnancy because in pregnancy you have all this extra blood flowing around um, and your heart's working extra hard um, and it is really challenging for someone who doesn't have um, a good like cardiac reserve and a, a kind of normal heart and lung function to be able to um, succeed in their pregnancy. Um, so it's a, definitely a, a thing to talk about with your doctors if you have that. Um, if someone has a heart failure, so um, uh, if someone has a heart that doesn't pump or squeeze quite as well, um, but it's very severe, or they have problems with the valves of their heart, sometimes that's a reason why uh, women have increased risk in pregnancy or maybe you should consider not to get pregnant. Um, if someone has very significant interstitial lung disease, um, uh, so um, uh, they consider it like a FBC greater less than one liter. And so that's when you do your pulmonary function test, you're doing the breathing and it's one of the measurements that they get from there. Um, but again, this is a judgment call and it's why you would be talking with your pulmonologist, you know, is right now the right time for me to get pregnant. If someone has significant kidney disease, um, that's also a reason um, uh, to potentially think um, that maybe pregnancy is not the right thing or at least not the right time um, because unfortunately pregnancy can also make kidney disease worse and um, the mom could end up on dialysis. Um, if patients have had a stroke, we usually recommend that they wait about six months before they get pregnant. Uh, patients who have very severe liver disease, um, patients who've had preeclampsia. So for those of you who don't know what preeclampsia is, preeclampsia is when uh, the mother uh, in pregnancy develops very high blood pressure. There can also be abnormalities in their blood tests like elevated liver enzymes and uh, elevated platelets, um, and it can lead to actual seizures. Um, so it's a very severe condition. Um, so if they've had that or something called help, can, uh, help um, which is kind of like the instinct version of preeclampsia. Um, if it was very severe and the um, mom was already on medicines in their prior pregnancies, um, that's also a reason, again, to have a, uh, a good talk with the high-risk OB doctors. There's some unsafe medications for pregnancy, and we'll talk about those in a second again. And then again, if someone's rheumatic disease, especially their myositis is active, then that's usually, um, again, when we would say, hey, maybe now's you know, not the right time. Um, so there's a, a couple of other factors in rheumatology uh, diseases, specifically in pregnancy, that do also change the risk. Um, so there's antibodies that um, your rheumatologist or your other uh, medical providers may have checked for in your blood work. Um, so one of those is called an SSA. Um, it's also sometimes called an anti-Rho antibody, or it's also sometimes called a kilodalton 52, which is more common in the myositis panels. Um, that are done. Um, so this antibody um, specifically uh, in, uh, increases the risk of the baby developing a disease. Um, so the thing that they, they develop or can develop, I should say, um, is something called neonatal lupus. Um, so neonatal being baby, lupus being one of our other rheumatic diseases. Um, so what happens is the antibodies that are circulating in your blood cross over the placenta 
cross over to baby. And then baby can have side effects of, of purely having your antibody in their blood. Um, and so those can be a rash that the baby develops um, after they're born um, up to the first six months. Uh, sometimes uh, the baby can have um, abnormal um, liver enzymes or low blood counts. Usually those two things go away. Um, it makes for some interesting baby photos, um, but we don't really worry about that. And the baby doesn't have lupus lifelong after this. It's just really a transient period after they're born. Um, but unfortunately, the antibodies can also cross over the placenta and actually irritate the electric system of the baby's heart. And so that can cause something called heart block. So the electric circuit of the heart stops working as well. Um, and unfortunately, that can be a permanent thing. So women who have this antibody are recommended to have heart ultrasounds um, and heart uh, kind of heartbeat testing of their infant while they're still pregnant. Um, and then also to be on something called hydroxychloroquine or Plaquenil um, to decrease the likelihood of that happening. Um, the other antibodies that we also take note of in rheumatology are called antiphospholipid antibodies. Um, these are antibodies that increase um, someone's risk of blood clots. Um, in women, they can also increase the risk of miscarriage and stillbirth and preeclampsia. Um, and so if, some, if a woman is pregnant and has these antibodies, um, we recommend that they um, start a low-dose aspirin to take every day to help prevent some of these side effects. So when I see a woman who's thinking about getting pregnant and they're in my clinic, I usually collect these antibodies if they've never been done before, uh, because these are additional risk factors that I want to make sure that I've assessed for um, before I say that, yes, this is a great time to get pregnant. Um, so what about medication safety in pregnancy? And this is definitely uh, a very um, uh, you know, an area where I spend a lot of time counseling patients. Um, so I kind of think about medications in kind of a red light, green light uh, type of fashion, um, because you can't remember all of them. You just have to kind of put them into categories. Um, so these are the medicines to me and from the research that exists, as well as the guidelines from the American College of Rheumatology, um, where we think that these are actually the safe medications in pregnancy. Um, so anakendra may not be a common medicine used in myositis, um, although there are some uh, uh, patients that I have um, who take this. Um, Low-dose aspirin um, is definitely very safe in pregnancy. Um, azathioprine um, is actually one of the safest medications that we have in pregnancy uh, because um, the uh, placenta actually can't metabolize it. So even though it may cross um, uh, to the baby, it doesn't actually uh, able to be metabolized. Um, so it's actually really great in that way. Um, cyclosporin is also very safe in pregnancy. Um, hydroxychloroquine. Um, IVIG is actually very good in pregnancy as well. I always think that babies who are born to moms who are on IVIG during their pregnancy are like supercharged and have great immune systems uh, because they were getting the IVIG from their mom the whole time. Um, and so I always think that they do really, really well in terms of infections and things um, after they are born. Uh, prednisone um, or other steroids like methylprednisolone um, are also um, considered safe in pregnancy, although we do usually try to use the lowest dose that's possible for the shortest period of time. Um, and I don't just start patients on prednisone just because they're pregnant. Um, I you know, typically wait and see you know, if someone has a flare or something like that. Um, there is some old myth out there that prednisone causes um, what's called a cleft palate um, or a cleft lip. Or, um, so those are some um, congenital malformations that babies can be born with. Um, but that has been disproven in multiple studies. So we don't think that that truly is the case. I do always worry, however, that prednisone has other side effects. Um, prednisone causes weight gain. I think most of you who have been on prednisone probably know that and can tell your doctor that very well. Um, you know, prednisone causes people to have high blood pressure, which can be a problem in some people for pregnancy already. Um, and it can definitely cause a lot of mood issues and sleep issues um, and, high, and um, high blood sugars as well, um, which are also concerning in pregnancy. So I think those are some other reasons to be um, judicious with prednisone and pregnancy. So I definitely use it when someone needs it, but I try to get patients really on the lowest dose possible during their pregnancy.
um, anti-inflammatory medicines, so like NSAIDs, like ibuprofen or naproxen, um, are thought to be safe up to um, 20 weeks. However, I will say there's a lot of a disagreement between the rheumatologist and the pharmacist and the ob doctors about this. Um, so uh, you will probably get lots of different answers. Um, sulfasalazine is a medicine that we sometimes use for arthritis uh, or for patients who have inflammatory bowel disease, um, but it's uh, very safe in pregnancy. Um, so is tacrolimus. Um, I know a lot of a few of my myositis patients take tacrolimus um, and it's a great medicine for pregnancy. And we actually know that because we also use it for things like kidney transplants. Um, and so it's also a good transplant medicine. Um, and then um, the other medicines that we know are pretty safe in pregnancy are the, the biologics, so specifically the TNF biologics, so things like um, Humira and Embril. Um, I know they're not commonly used in myositis, uh, but I know there's a lot of overlap of myositis and other diseases, so I left them on the, this chart. Um, so then there's the yellow category. So medications where we probably have a little bit more information or gaining information, um, but medicines that may be a little bit newer on the market. And so we haven't quite had a chance to, to learn about these. Um, specifically for patients with myositis, um, I think about tocilizumab. Um, uh, being uh, more popular, more commonly used, um, as well as our JAK inhibitors. So things like tofacitinib and baricitinib um, are used now a lot more commonly in myositis. We don't really know about them. They're too new. Um, and in terms of the size of the medicine, um, like physically it's very small. And so it's thought that it actually will transfer across the placenta versus some of our other medicines that are too big to do that. Um, specifically rituximab. I know I have a lot of patients who have myositis who are on rituximab. Um, and rituximab is actually a very big molecule. And so when we think about that crossing the placenta and getting over to baby, it actually doesn't do that till very late in pregnancy. So like towards like the mid of, mid of the second, uh, towards the third trimester. So I use rituximab a lot in my patients during their first trimester or their early second trimester. So we can give you a dose, keep you safe, proceed with a successful pregnancy, and then plan again for a dose after you delivered. But baby doesn't really see the medicine because the rituximab doesn't cross over the placenta early on in pregnancy. Um, then we have the red medications, um, which are the ones that to me, rheumatologists care the most about um, because we have, these are the ones that we actually know can cause harm. And I'll go over them in detail in the next slide. Um, so methotrexate, it's a great medication for myositis. Um, however, it, it does have a risk of birth defects. And women who get pregnant on methotrexate actually have double the risk of miscarriage. So we talked at the beginning that the risk of miscarriage is one in four. So about 50% of women who are on methotrexate um, who uh, get pregnant actually have a miscarriage. Um, and methotrexate in a bigger dose than what we give in rheumatology is actually used as an abortive agent as well. So this is why your doctor may have talked to you if you take methotrexate of why you should take contraception um, and use, um, uh, you know, and try to actually prevent pregnancy if you're on this medication. Um, for mycophenolate, another great medication that we use to treat myositis, we use to treat interstitial lung disease, um, and lots of other things in rheumatology. Um, it unfortunately also has an increased risk, risk of birth defect and also has a pretty considerable miscarriage rate as well. So again, uh, um, if you're on these medications, these are probably why your doctors have counseled you that you should probably be on some sort of contraception if you're sexually active. And if you're thinking about being pregnant, well, then we should try to give you off of these medications because they're not safe for pregnancy. Um, Luflonamide is not a commonly used medicine in myositis. It's more of an arthritis medicine, um, but I left it on here because I know all of our diseases overlap. Um, and uh, it also is not considered safe for pregnancy. And if you do get pregnant on it or are planning on it, there's actually medicine that you take and it actually helps wash out the, the medicine from your system. Um, and so again, why pregnancy planning is really important. Um, cyclophosphamide, um, also used to treat myositis, it's used to treat interstitial lung disease, it's used to treat vasculitis and lupus, um, is really our highest risk medication. Um, the studies, there's not really a lot of studies on cyclophosphamide um, because uh, most of them just show that that uh, women unfortunately have miscarriages when they're on this medication and they're pregnant, um, like 100% of them in some of the studies that are out there. It's a little bit also hard to study this medicine because it's also used 
uh, to treat different types of cancer. And so cancer patients, however, aren't just on cyclophosphamide. They're on lots of other medicines to treat their cancer. And so it's a little bit hard to tease out if it's the cyclophosphamide or the other medicines. But really the party line is just don't, don't we should not get pregnant on cyclophosphamide. Um, if you're getting cyclophosphamide, um, it's standard of practice to do a pregnancy test before each dose. Um, and um, if you are on cyclophosphamide and you've kind of completed your course or you're thinking about getting pregnant and you talk with your doctors about it, um, then it, you should usually wait three months um, before you try to get pregnant. Um, that wait is because we want the medication to kind of be able to wash out of your system. Um, but also if you're, you know, um, needing cyclophosphamide, you may be pretty sick. Um, or may have more severe disease manifestations. And so we also want to make sure that you do okay not on when you're not getting the medication and that perhaps whatever other pregnancy safe medication that we put you on is actually going to take care of your rheumatic disease. Um, but there's lots of other medicines out there, right? Like people aren't just on the, the ones that I mentioned. Um, so there's other great resources to learn about medication safety. So the one I like the best is mother to baby. Um, so mother to baby is really great because they have these fact sheets. So you can go online, um, find the fact sheets um, and uh, specific to your medication and look them up. Um, you can print them out for your doctor. You can print them out for your mom who's really worried about you. Um, you can print them out for your friends who are telling you to stop your medicine sometimes. Um, and so I really love them as an educational tool. The other great thing about mother to baby is that they will um, uh, call you. You can email them. You can chat online with them. And so if they don't have the medicine that you're on, then they'll send you the information that they do have about it, which I think is really great. Um, the other thing that they do is research. So say like the newer medications like tofacitinib, um, there's not that much information out there, but some patients can't stop their medicines to get pregnant. Uh, and so they also do research on medications that we don't know that much about. So um, they're really great. Um, all right, so now you got pregnant, you talked to your doctor, you planned, you're on the right medications. Everyone said that it was the right time for you. So now what after I'm pregnant? Um, so tell everybody that you got pregnant. Yay, that's so exciting, right? Some good news, we love good news. Um, the next thing is probably to make an appointment with the OB-GYN and, and the high-risk um, maternal fetal medicine doctors. If you didn't already meet with them before, is the only time to do that now. Um, to me, a rheumatologist should be following your entire pregnancy. I unfortunately hear stories of women telling me that, oh, I told my rheumatologist I was pregnant and they like told me to come back nine months later. Um, that to me is really concerning because if you flare, what, what's going to happen or who's going to be monitoring your rheumatic disease? Um, OB-GYN doctors and the high-risk OB doctors are good, but they have no training in rheumatic diseases. They don't know anything about using our medications. Um, and so I think it's really important um, that you maintain relationship with your, all your doctors um, because you need them all and, and you need this whole team behind you. Um, and so if you're pregnant, don't stop your medicines, right? You planned it. You have talked with everybody. I'm on safe medications. Um, so you shouldn't stop the ones that are safe because we want you to stay with your disease really well controlled throughout your pregnancy. Um, you may need extra monitoring. Um, and again, that's kind of what the high risk um, OB doctors do is they do extra monitoring to make sure that you and baby are okay throughout the pregnancy. Um, low dose aspirin um, may also be recommended to you until you deliver. Um, so there's a lot of growing evidence that um, women who are at higher risk, so those include women who have um, high blood pressure issues, kidney problems, um, or who have autoimmune diseases are at increased risk for preeclampsia, which we know. Um, but low dose aspirin may actually decrease that risk. Um, and so it's a very safe medication to use in pregnancy. And so it's now recommended for most women um, to take a low dose aspirin every day during their pregnancy. Um, so what about pregnancy outcomes in myositis specifically? Um, so unfortunately, myositis can actually be triggered by women being pregnant um, or kind of be triggered after someone delivers. So that includes someone who already has a diagnosis or someone who's a brand new diagnosis. So that's um, uh, important to know, especially if you already have the diagnosis. Um, Treatment during pregnancy and the periods where your where your myositis is the quietest um, is associated with the better outcomes. Um, so again, that's why coming back to planning, that is really important to plan. 
Uh, unfortunately, however, some of the research does show that even if your disease is doing great, right, you did all the things, you saw all the doctors, you're on all the medications, and your, your labs look great, you feel fantastic, um, that even if you have inactive myositis, that you actually have some increased risk still. Um, so there's increased risk of miscarriages, of your baby being smaller. So um, uh, so that sometimes that's called something called IUGR, um, where they're like generally overall small, and then unfortunately delivering early as well. Um, unfortunately, myositis can also flare during pregnancy, um, and when it does, unfortunately, it can have some bad outcomes for baby. Um, so that increases the risk of miscarriage, it also increases the risk of stillbirth as well as um, delivering early. Um, women with myositis, especially if they flare, also have higher rates of having a cesarean section. Um, so instead of de de delivering vaginally, they'll have a C-section instead, which makes sense. It's really hard to press to, to push a, a baby um, and, uh, and labor if your muscles are inflamed. Um, but if you flare, um, it definitely increases the risk of that. Um, the earlier you, a flare happens in someone's pregnancy, then um, the outcomes may actually be a little bit worse. So if you're flaring in first trimester, it may have more um, repercussions versus flaring in the third. But of course we can't figure out why we why people flare anyway. So um, just is more of the challenge of rheumatology. Um, it's this old study um, is really the only data that's out there. Um, there was about 50 women who they looked at myositis pregnancies. They had myositis as a diagnosis already. Um, it showed that like 44% of them flared. The important thing to know about this is that it's kind of old data. Um, and I think, you know, we do a much better job of treating patients with myositis now than we ever did before. Um, and so I think that's always important when we're looking at studies and when we're looking at statistics that we have to look and see what, you know, what medicines were even available back then. Was it just steroids? Or are they just giving people lots of steroids? And they were. And so I guess they're not going to do as well as someone now, you know, who's doing great on azathioprine and tacrolimus, for example. So I think it's always important to think about those um, when we look at studies. Um, so uh, also, um, disease activity itself is associated um, more without, with like problems in baby, unfortunately. So although your myositis may be active during your pregnancy, um, it may have more effect on your baby than on you. Um, so what about delivery, right? So we made it all the way through pregnancy. We did pretty good. We didn't have any flares. We stayed on our pregnancy safe medications and now it's time to deliver. Um, so there is just increased risk uh, of having a cesarean section in general across women um, who have rheumatic diseases. Um, but myositis is a little bit more. And again, some of that goes to if your muscles are inflamed and you're flaring around your delivery time, it's just a lot harder to labor um, and deliver a baby. Um, which we already talked about. Um, so in terms of like how you should deliver, right? So say you're doing fine, you're not flaring, how like, you know, how should I deliver? To me, that is the discussion between the patient and the obstetrician at the time um, and the rest of their medical team, because it's not just about the myositis, right? There's lots of other factors that go into whether someone should have a C-section or not. How's the baby doing? Uh, you know, how are you doing? Um, you know, are there other issues? Like, do you have high blood pressure? Do you um, have arthritis in your hips? And that makes it really hard to deliver a baby. Um, do you have contractures somewhere from your um, myositis? Um, and so to me, like, this is a very individual decision uh, that you should make um, with a team and at more at the time closer to delivery than, you know, when you're five weeks pregnant and say, well, I'm totally going to have a C-section. To me, we wait till the end you know, towards the end of pregnancy to kind of figure that out. Um, there are some guidelines that women who have higher risk pregnancies, and so that includes almost all of my patients with autoimmune diseases, um, that if we actually deliver women early, um, so that includes induction, so that's where they give you medications um, to start having labor, um, then that can actually improve outcomes um, for mom and decrease pregnancy complications, uh, and so improve outcomes for moms and babies. So if we take uh, if we deliver women earlier at 39 weeks, then we decrease the likelihood of kind of poor outcomes for everybody. So that may be something that you hear or that you're told as your pregnancy progresses. I will say to me, um, most patients who have rheumatic diseases, particularly myositis, unfortunately, 
are probably too complicated to be cared for by a midwife um, unless they have an obstetrician like really overseeing their care and also probably too complicated um, and too high risk um, to unfortunately have things like a home birth or birthing centers. I know there's a lot of there's a lot of people's desires, um, but to me, again, my goal is always to have a healthy mom and a healthy baby at the end. Um, and and the, you know, I think the best way to do those is where the risks can be lowered and people really be monitored very well um, during their pregnancy and after. Um, there is some other studies about um, delivery for patients with myositis. Um, so this one looked at patients with dermatomyositis and polymyositis. They tended to stay a little bit longer in the hospital than women who didn't have myositis. Um, and then women with myositis also tended to have a little bit more issues with high blood pressure and preeclampsia that we had already talked about. Um, we talked about how myositis can flare um, uh, or or kind of put a start as the first time after someone delivers. So I try to make sure that all of my patients have an appointment with me um, within like four to six weeks after they deliver, because that's usually when things start to flare up. Um, and again, you've delivered this baby, you were in great remission, you were doing fantastic. So stay on your medications after you after you deliver, because most of the medications that are safe for pregnancy are also safe for um, breastfeeding. And I'll get there on the next slide. I think it's really important uh, for women who, especially if they're their first baby and they have a rheumatic disease, they don't know what normal is, right? Should I be so tired? Should I be so weak? Should I be so swollen? Um, and so I think taking, you know, making sure to take care of yourself. Everybody focuses on the baby after you are pregnant and after you deliver. Um, and unfortunately, moms sometimes don't get all the attention, um, but you definitely need all the attention. So um, don't feel bad about it and don't feel bad about reaching out to your doctors. If you're someone who got infusions before or during pregnancy, then it's time to schedule your infusions as well. So your IVIG, your rituximab, um, definitely time to get those scheduled um, even before you deliver so you can have them ready to go uh, postpartum. Um, in terms of uh, lactation, there's really no restrictions, especially none that are specific to myositis itself. Um, and to me, however a baby is fed is the best way for them um, to go. There's many ways to feed babies, thankfully. Um, and so I think whatever works best for you and for your family and for your baby is the best thing. Um, I will say sometimes for um, uh, women, I do recommend them going to occupational therapy because sometimes my patients who do have myositis or arthritis have a hard time positioning or holding um, or even doing things like putting a baby in a stroller or doing the car seat. Those car seats are hard. Uh, and so I think getting occupational therapy involved is really helpful for a lot of my patients. Um, and I think also considering a lactation consultant, um, you want someone who has the international board of uh, lactation consulting behind their name. Um, and so I think those are also important people to have on your team after you deliver. Um, this is the medication safety um, for uh, lactation. So you can see a lot more things are in the green category um, than in this yellow or red. The reds are the same. They are like really didn't change from before. Um, but a lot of the other medications that um, do cr sometimes cross the placenta or cross it later in pregnancy um, are actually safe for, for breastfeeding. Um, that's because um, even though they're a big protein, um, they really just can't get into the breast milk because they're so big. And even if they did, um, our, you know, the reason why we have to give injections and infusions is because our stomach is really good at breaking down proteins. And that's actually what your baby's stomach would also do if it goes through the breast milk. So um, say for rituximab, for example, um, there may be a very small amount that goes into breast milk, but the amount that would go actually gets kind of um, chewed up uh, by and processed by your baby's stomach and not absorbed into their system, uh, which is why you have to get it as an infusion. So um, to me, there's lots of safe medications um, out there uh, for lactation, especially for my rheumatic disease patients. Um, so what if you actually don't wanna be pregnant? Or what if you just had a baby and you're like, well, okay, I don't wanna do that for a couple more years. Um, or what if you're on medication that's unsafe for pregnancy, like the ones we talked about before. Um, so Bedsider and the American College of Rheumatology actually got together and made some pregnancy, I'm sorry, some contraception guidelines for patients specifically with rheumatic diseases. Um, because there are some reasons why some patients can't take some um, 
contraceptives. Um, so going through this chart on the green, the top area, um, so things like IUDs and implants are really safe for everybody, and they're really the most effective contraceptives that we had. I also think the fact that you don't have to remember to take them, you can't lose them, um, you can't, you know, leave them at your friend's house, um, I think are really good things. Um, and so I will say I encourage a lot of these in my in my patients. Um, things like the mini pill. So the mini pill is a birth control pill that's only progesterone. Uh, and so um, it's a good medication because some of our patients have issues with blood clotting problems. Uh, and so it's a good option. Condoms are always great. They're the only thing that prevent against sexually transmitted diseases. Um, pulling out is always there, but I never recommend it because it's very unsuccessful. It's only about 50%. Um, there's things like the depot shot and the ring and then other birth control pills. Um, these are typically safer in patients who have myositis um, versus like my lupus patients where they have more of these blood clotting antibodies um, where these um, should not be used. Um, and then the birth control patch, um, again, if you have blood clotting issues or have had a blood clot, um, then it's not recommended that you use that um, birth control and that there's hopefully some other options for you. Um, so these are called LARCs. They're called the long acting reversible contraceptives. And again, why I really like them, they're really effective. They're really reliable. Uh, they don't have that many side effects because they're only progesterone. Um, they don't, they're discreet. No one really has to know that you have them. Um, and they can be used if you have a history of blood clots um, or blood clotting issues. And I will say they also don't really interact with any of your other medicines. So that's another good reason why. They also take away your periods a lot. So that's good. Um, however, vasectomies and tubal ligations are always an option. If you're like, you know, I'm, I don't want to have any more children, then I think those are also really great options um, to think about. Um, there's also emergency contraception. Um, so a lot of patients don't realize that emergency contraception is good for everybody. Um, there's no restrictions on it. So patients with autoimmune diseases, patients with blood clotting problems, um, patients with lung problems, heart problems, everyone can use emergency contraception. Um, so IUDs can be used as emergency contraception. Um, uh, they just, they insert them. Uh, it has to be within five days of the unprotected intercourse. Um, there's two different types of pills that are used as emergency contraception. So there's what's more called like the morning after pill or plan B, um, which you can actually get at pharmacies and over the counter. You can also get it through Amazon. Um, and uh, it works best within three days. And I will say there are some um, weight restrictions on it. It actually works better for people who weigh un under 165 pounds. Um, uh, however, there's also a, a prescription kind of plan B morning after pill called Ella. Um, it works um, within five days of taking it, and it's better for people who are over 165 pounds. Um, the hard part is you need a prescription for this one. And so, you know, have to, you, that's, that means you have to call, you know, call your doctor, go to the pharmacy um, versus the other ones. I kind of tell my patients just to have these around their house. They're good for five years. Um, and you never know who might need them. Maybe your friend needs them, maybe somebody else. Um, so uh, it's something that uh, I have my patients keep around. Um, but I think it's really important to remember that there are safe emergency contraceptions out there for our rheumatic disease patients. Um, so infertility, the last kind of topic that I'll, I'll touch on. Um, so being infertile means that you're unable to conceive for six months, um, if you're over the age of 35, um, or if you've been trying for a year if you're under 35. Um, so infertility is increased in rheumatic diseases, although I feel like every single paper out there says that it's not, but, but it is. Um, and, and why is it? So um, because of rheumatic diseases, a lot of patients delay dating or marriage, because unfortunately, most of our diseases kind of happen when people are doing those sorts of things. Uh, and if you don't feel good, or you're going to lots of doctor's appointments, uh, you know, don't like how prednisone makes you look, um, then, you know, you may have a delay in meeting someone or dating or um, even having sex. So I think uh, that's one of the reasons why some of our patients are more infertile because they just wait a little bit longer than the general public. Um, a lot of patients are on medicines that you shouldn't get pregnant on. And so we hopefully do a good job of counseling to take birth control. And so then um, uh, just is a little bit more timed in terms of the pregnancy. And so some of that can just cause a natural delay um, as well. Some of my patients are really worried about having a kid. They're not sure if they can take care of them. They're not sure if they can take care of the child and themselves and their family. Um, and so that definitely causes a delay. 
Um, unfortunately, rheumatology patients um, are still being told that they can't get pregnant. Um, and again, there are some patients who maybe we should say that too, but it's really, really a very small population. Um, and most rheumatic disease patients can have very successful pregnancies. Uh, rheumatology patients actually have a lot of sexual difficulties and kind of low sex drive. Um, and so if you're not having sex, it's a little bit hard to get pregnant that way. Um, there is some evidence out there that chronic inflammation does actually lower your egg supply. So women are born with all the eggs that they'll ever have their entire life. Uh, and so inflammation uh, can definitely affect those over time. Um, and so there's some studies where they have looked at ultrasounds as well as some blood markers and found that women with myositis, as well as other rheumatic diseases, have lower egg reserves um, than other um, women. Uh, and then interestingly, there's increased risk of, um, of patients with rheumatic diseases having other things that contribute to infertility. So things like polycystic ovarian syndrome and endometriosis. Um, and so then it's hard because, right, you've got, you've got the rheumatic disease and then maybe you also have another reason to have infertility. And so then actually it's kind of compounded together. Um, there's really no specific information on infertility right now um, in myositis, but maybe one day there will be. Um, there's also medications that we give that affect fertility. The main one is, is really cyclophosphamide. Um, so cyclophosphamide, again, is really used for our kind of most um, serious conditions. Um, we certainly use it in myositis, especially for patients who have interstitial lung disease or really bad calcinosis. Um, but uh, it's used in a lot of other rheumatic diseases as well. Um, so it does decrease the number of eggs that someone has. So again, this ovarian reserve, the eggs that we're born with, it does decrease those. And then in men, it can also decrease sperm and kind of damage them. And actually those two things are irreversible. We can't make more eggs. Um, and men who have issues with, with cyclophosphamide, they can't really make things firm. Um, so if someone is on this medication or they're talking about it with you, fertility preservation is also really important and something that you should bring up. So there's medications where they can kind of um, put your eggs and make them hibernate, make your ovaries hibernate. Um, uh, so that's something called Lupron. Uh, you could also freeze your eggs um, if that's something that you would be interested in pursuing and you have time to, which is always a challenge in our patients is that unfortunately our patients are sometimes really sick and we don't have time to do this where like other patients say like cancer patients do. Um, and then for men who get cyclophosphamide, um, it's recommended that they get um, sperm freezed as well. Um, the hard part in the United States is that a lot of this is not covered by insurance. Um, and so depending on what state you live in or what type of insurance you have, this may not be available to you um, or you may have to pay out of pocket for it. Um, but I think fertility preservation is really overlooked by rheumatologists um, and as well as other subspecialists who are giving cyclophosphamide. Um, and so I think um, we need to raise awareness to that. Uh, for patients who take things like NSAIDs, like ibuprofen or naproxen, um, it actually can prevent ovulation, but that's actually reversible. It's only when you're taking it. So once you stop the um, medication, um, then you're able to ovulate again. Um, so that, but some people are you know, trying to get pregnant, but they take ibuprofen and they don't kind of realize that maybe that's why they're having a harder time. Um, there is also some concern that steroids themselves, so prednisone and methylprednisolone, uh, may actually um, kind of alter the hormone levels uh, in the brain. And that could also contribute to things like uh, low egg reserves, as well as um, issues with ovulation. It's really hard to study because you can't take the disease part out of it. And then there's lots of different doses of steroids and regimens. Um, so uh, it's a little bit challenging to study. Um, but I will say for some of my patients, it does seem to make it harder for them to get pregnant. Um, so um, assisted reproductive technology is kind of the general term for things like IVF and IUIs and things like that. So I'll just touch on that briefly. Um, so there's medicines uh, to make you make more eggs. Um, eggs are in follicles. And so those are sometimes called Clomid or Letrozol. So those are medicines that an ob doctor could give you and it makes you make more eggs. And the thought is that if you have more eggs, then you're, you have higher chances of getting pregnant after that. So there's something called an IUI. So that's where they take sperm, they put it in a catheter and they would put the catheter through your cervix into the uterus and hope to increase your risk of getting pregnant that way. Uh, and then there's IVF. So that's where they give you medicines to grow the eggs. Then they do a surgery to remove the eggs. Then they combine the eggs and the sperm in a lab. 
they watch them grow into embryos and then they put the embryos in your uterus or anybody else's uterus because you could do something like what's called a surrogate where someone else um, could potentially have your child for you. Um, ICSI is like a thing that they do for IVF where they like actually take the sperm and insert it into the egg itself. Um, and then an embryo transfer is where they take the embryo that's made and then put it into a uterus, whoever's it may be. Um, you can also, again, freeze eggs, freeze sperm, or some people freeze embryo, right? So, um, so they'll combine eggs and sperm and then freeze those um, for a time later on. So there are some guidelines from the American College of Rheumatology about doing uh, IVF and IUI and using these medicines. And it basically is like, if your disease is well controlled, then it's a totally okay to go and proceed through this process. Um, so I think that's always really important because some of my patients also get turned away from IVF and it's just lack of knowledge because the doctors who do that, the fertility doctors just don't quite understand our diseases. Um, so if you're really active, then you shouldn't get pregnant. We already talked about that. Um, but if you are not, then we should um, uh, like proceed and help you get pregnant. Um, again, if you have these blood clotting antibodies, um, then those increase your risk slightly. Um, uh, IVF is a lot of extra hormones. Um, and so we just have to be careful if you do have those blood clotting antibodies that we should use things like aspirin or other blood thinners um, to um, decrease the risk. Um, so, so say you're someone, you talk with your doctors, right? Well, we, you're on the safe medications, you've been trying for a year, um, you've had the work up, everything else is fine, and you just can't get pregnant, and you really would like to, and so you'd like to go through IVF, right? So, and you like to do it right now. So uh, you don't want to bank the eggs, so that's this side. So if you're like, well, I want to get pregnant in the future sometime, then you can say, okay, I would like to freeze my eggs. So then you can stay on all of your medicines except for cyclophosphamide, um, because it can affect the egg growth. Um, but you're in this yes category, right? I want to get pregnant now. Um, I'm on safe medications, right? I'm on azathioprine. I'm on a little bit of prednisone. Um, and I'm on, you know, IVIG. Um, so you can stay on all of those medications. No one should stop them. Um, and no one should give you extra steroids just because you're trying to get pregnant. But I think, again, it's really important that women who have rheumatic diseases can use uh, assisted reproductive technology to achieve their goals of their family growing. All right, that's the end of my talk. So thank you so much for having me. Uh, I hope I covered all the topics that everyone was interested in. I see questions already, so that's exciting. Um, I did put some uh, email. I'm very open to people emailing me. I know there's lots of questions and unfortunate misinformation out there. Um, I put the links to some of the other things. Um, and the American College of Rheumatology does have guidelines for reproductive health. Um, uh, we're, They'll, they'll be shortly redone. We're, we're working on the next version of them as well. Um, but uh, they're out there. A lot of doctors don't know that they're out there, even rheumatologists. Um, so I think uh, it's important if you're getting pushback when someone says, no, you can't take azathioprine in pregnancy. It's unsafe. And you're like, no. So there's information out there that we can help you with. Um, and I'm always down to helpful. Um, I'm also doing a research study. Um, about what um, women with different rheumatic diseases um, and uh, Un, uh, understand and know about infertility um, or uh, any procedures or treatments that you've had done for it. So if you're interested, um, I will put the um, uh, uh, link in the chat. Um, you can also use the QR code here um, as well to uh, get that information that way. And that's the end of my talk. That was awesome, Kumi. No. Thank you, Dr. Ventura. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Edens, for your informative presentation. A lot of what you said resonates with my personal story. Up next, we have Dr. Ventura. Dr. Ventura is a board-certified rheumatologist with a primary focus on inflammation, myopathies, autoimmune lung, and skin diseases. Dr. Ventura serves in several international research groups that aim to advance knowledge in the fields of interstitial lung disease and myositis. Dr. Ventura currently serves on the board of directors here at the Myositis Association. Please welcome Dr. Ventura. Thank you so much, Holly, for uh, your kind presentation. It's gonna be very hard to follow Dr. Edens after her very comprehensive talk. 
but I just want to mention a few more things that I think are very important to this audience. And I hope hopefully this additional information will help us empower even more as we are thinking and talking about pregnancy and maternity for patients with myositis. Let me share my screen. Do you all see my screen? Hopefully, yes. Yes, you do. Wonderful. Yes, do. Okay. So my, again, I wanted to devote a few minutes, I promise I won't take that long, to talk a little bit more about disparities in maternity care. Uh, this is a topic that is close to our heart as rheumatologists, as rheumatologists who care for women of color. And this is something that I really want to come across uh, to let you know what is the status of our, of what is happening in our country when we're talking about maternity care in minorities. Okay, so first of all, I want to mention to you, let's, let's dedicate just one second to talk, what is disparities? We talk about, we hear a lot and we, we say a lot this word nowadays. And I want to give you the definition because this definition will be important for the rest of our conversation. So disparities mean differences and we're talking about healthcare here. So differences in healthcare, the result in the particular type of health difference that is closely linked to economic, social, or environmental disadvantage. So anything that surrounds us uh, that is, is considered to be a disadvantage in a population is considered a disparity. And I'm gonna give you some examples of how disparities are important in maternity care. So unfortunately, here in the United States, 2022, we still have women dying uh, during pregnancy and right after pregnancy. And, and numbers way higher than we would expect in other development, uh, developed countries. There are many reasons of why that happens. Uh, cardiovascular diseases are common uh, reasons for death during maternity, uh, especially for things such as cardiomyopathy, which is basically heart failure that, re that can result during pregnancy or postpartum. Hypertensive disorders such as preeclampsia or pre uh, pregnancy-induced hypertension, as Dr. Edens mentioned, are very common complications during pregnancy and they can be severe and they can cause death. Hemorrhages or excessive bleeding um, is a very common cause of death as well, especially in the postpartum period and infections too. So those are the I would say the most common uh, reasons of women still dying uh, during pregnancy, right after pregnancy in the United States. Uh, the, these numbers are absolutely shocking and absolutely appalling. And I want to share with you, so again, you understand what the situation is and you start thinking and reflecting, why is that the case? What we can do to change it? So black women, and Hispanic women, and also women of other minorities, such as Native American and Pacific Islanders, do have increased risk for dying during pregnancy. And the numbers are huge. As you can see here, Black and Hispanic women are eight, nine times more likely to die from com complications of hypertensive disorders, uh, such as preeclampsia, compared to white women. Black women are more likely to die six times more from respiratory complications compared to white women. These are just examples. And these numbers, unfortunately, are repeated over and over again all over the United States. And beyond causes of death, there are many other complications that happen more frequent among um, women of color in our country that can make pregnancy even more complicated. And this is in addition to having an underlying autoimmune disease. Our patients, um, uh, uh, our women of color are more likely to have in bleeding disorders, preeclampsia, asthma flares, in pregnancy induced diabetes or being diabetic before getting pregnant. Again, a lot of our patients take steroids. A lot of our patients increase their weight doing treatment for myositis because of steroids and that increases the risk for diabetes. Blood clots are more common and also postpartum complications, hemorrhages after delivery, high-grade lacerations from vaginal deliveries, and major infections are all more common among uh, our minority um, pregnant women. And these complications, again, are added on to the fact that our patients are already starting with an autoimmune disease that needs to be controlled. 
And again, I just want to mention here how this, how appalling these numbers are. So as you can see here, non-white women can be up to 400 times more likely to have those complications that I mentioned. And the burden seems to be particularly significant among black women. They are the ones that are mostly affected by these complications. Uh, these complications, when they happen, they are more likely to happen at early ages, affect uh, uh, younger moms in minority groups. And uh, these conditions, when affecting women of color, they usually not adequately managed as they should be. So all those things, again, add on to the risks of these complications being more common among minorities and also um, uh, having more deaths uh, in the pregnant patients from minority groups. One thing that I want to mention as well is not only about these diseases being more common, but also um, we know that there is a lot of disparity when it comes to delivery. So there is a lot of data. There are many articles out there showing that women of color usually deliver their children in hospitals of lower quality compared to white women. And these hospitals who serve, that serve minority groups, black serving hospitals, particularly, particularly in New York City, for example, where most of this data is coming from, have shown that these hospitals, unfortunately, a lot of times they don't have personnel that is as prepared as the ones who serve in hospitals that usually, they usually provide support for white pregnant uh, uh, patients as well. So again, the disparity is, is, goes way beyond the diseases that affect our population. The, dis, the disparities are also, include, uh, are also problematic during delivery. So even the place where the delivery is happening is different uh, between women of color and white women. And I want to, again, bring these topics, all these terrible numbers, that happen over and over again in our country uh, to reflection here. Why is maturity health worse in women of color? And what can we do about this? As you can see in this, uh, in this figure, there are many reasons of why that happens. One specific reason is not enough to explain why women of color are more affected by diseases such as di diabetes, hypertension, obesity, depression, pregnancy complications. Uh, we know that there are many issues related to patient individual um, um, factors that can interfere and collaborate to these disparities. Again, our patients sometimes uh, la lack uh, good insurances that provide them the support to go to good hospitals and have good deliveries. A lot of our patients, women of color, usually offer uh, low literacy. Uh, uh, we have more patients who have being in school for a few years among women of color compared to, to white women in this country. Community support is something that is also very, very, very different between our, the communities we are talking about. So violence, crime, poverty, housing, problems with housing, again, domestic violence, all those things are very, can be very different and can have a huge impact on how healthy your pregnancy and delivery are. Provider factors, unfortunately, uh, we know that structural racism is something that is very, is still very common in the medical practice. And there are many stories and the reported data showing how different sometimes women of color are treated in the hospital compared to the white counterparts. And this is something that uh, we are dedicating time as physicians and as healthcare providers to learn more and trying to break those patterns and provide better care. But this is something that unfortunately will take time and will take a lot of effort, a lot of effort from patients and a lot of effort from the medical, uh, from the medical system as well. So again, all these factors together, they interfere to a big a whole cycle that is involving pregnancy. So we are talking about preconception care, prenatal care, delivery in hospital care, and the postpartum period, because all these factors have their impact in many different points in this cycle. They all contribute to increase morbidity or in increase complications and increase mortality among women of color. What can we do? How can we change this trend? By, don't, by no means I want to scare any of you and by no means I want you 
to end this in a in a bad no in a sad no because i think whenever we see so many disparities we see so many differences and and terrible numbers that means that we have work to do we have a lot of work to do and a lot of terrain to gain and reverse this story uh, a lot of this change will come from public policies and is extremely important to vote again make sure that you are putting your vote you're casting your vote in um in elected officials that you trust will make a difference for healthcare, maternity care, and other policies that will contribute to decrease those disparities in our country. But also I want to talk to you about individual measures. And a lot of here is what Dr. Kogi Edens just described. And I really want to mention again, you are your best advocate and understanding, learning, having knowledge about those, all those important topics that Dr. Edens alluded to, it is your best tool to be successful in this story. So first of all, optimizing your health before conception. Again, are you taking the medications that are considered safe during, during, uh, during pregnancy? This is something that it requires a very close interaction with your doctor. Are you exercising? Are you optimizing your muscle health? Especially have an active myositis. Again, um, having, be, having stronger muscles, well-conditioned muscles before pregnancy can be helpful to, um, to have a more, a, a, a less complicated pregnancy to be able to sustain those nine months walking with your baby and, 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 and also decreasing uh, pain. And also we know it is important when it comes to delivery, right? If your muscles are not well-conditioned, sometimes the best option would be a succession. And also control of your myositis and other associated complications such as interstitial lung disease just before uh, conception. Are you optimizing your myositis to the best possible? Is it on the remission? Is it on remission or as close as possible to being on a remission? Those are important discussions that you need to have in preparation of your pregnancy. Plan your pregnancy. This is the best thing you can do. And this is something you need to communicate right away. Dr. Edens and I are constantly asking our patients, hey, are you planning to get pregnant the next year? Or this is something that ever crossed your mind? Yes, no, how can I help you? So planning your pregnancy, the earlier the better. There is no early date to start planning your pregnancy. When you start planning, it's much easier to adjust your medications and to have a goal in mind. And this is something, again, that can never be done um, too early. Invest in your doctor-patient relationship. As Dr. Eden said, sometimes, unfortunately, there are many providers out there, including rheumatologists who care for women in reproductive age, that don't really have a good understanding about what exactly do we need to do to make sure that you're gonna have a successful pregnancy, or even if pregnancy is the right thing to you. And trying to invest in a doctor um, that you feel comfortable with, you feel safety, you feel safe talking about these topics is really crucial because we want to be there for all those months of pregnancy, those months before pregnancy and these months after pregnancy as well. We want to be there and see you in the clinic with your baby in your, in your arms if this is what you wanna have. Optimizing your prenatal care, as Dr. Eden's mentioned, is very important that you light up with a good high-risk OB and the high risk OB visit should happen as early as possible. As soon as you become pregnant, is this something that needs to happen? So, hey, is this, is this part of your pregnancy plan? Have you already asked your doctor or looked in your insurance list, who is the high risk OB close by to me? Uh, so I can get someone in mind whenever I become pregnant, this is, this is what is in your mind, in your plans. And again, planning your hospital care, as we discussed just a few slides ago, unfortunately, women of color are usually uh, have, um, have their prenatal care, sometimes in delivery in hospitals that may have worse metrics compared to other hospitals, and trying to find the best hospital possible to deliver your baby, the one that you know you're going to have a good doctor, the one that you know you're going to be treated treated safely and respectfully makes a huge amount of difference. So again, this is a quick overview about how important, how crucial is this, is this topic. If anything, I wanted to provide you the information that you need to empower yourself to, to educate yourself, educate your community, help others who are in the same track. So we can also, you can all have a better future for our moms and our babies. Thank you, I really appreciate your time.
Thank you, Dr. Ventor, for that um, presentation highlighting such an important topic for our community. Up next, we will have Crystal Cunningham to speak on her journey to motherhood before being diagnosed with polymyositis with interstitial lung disease back in 2018. Please welcome Crystal. Can you see me, Holly? We cannot see you, we can hear you. Okay, sorry, I'm new to this. <laughs> Let's try this. There we go. Okay. Now can you Perfect. see me? Yes. Sorry, I'm at work. <laughs> um, so thanks for having me. Um, so yeah, I was diagnosed in late 2018 and I had a six-year-old little boy and my daughter was about eight months old. And so um, it was very challenging because I couldn't, I got to the point where you know, I couldn't pick her up. And so I had to become creative with that. I would shove my arms underneath her body and kind of pick her up like this, which I can still do. I just couldn't really use my hands. Um, one time I was at a doctor's appointment and I couldn't get, I got her into the car, but then I couldn't get her out of the car. So I asked, um, a stranger to help me which was really embarrassing but she was very nice and she helped me and all that so it's been um a struggle but I'd say that the kids are the thing that keeps me going you know they make me smile I'm really glad that I have them on the days that I feel really bad because you know they're so sweet and innocent and it just it really has helped me I was really glad that I had them before because you know, there's days when you're just like, why am I, why am I doing this? So they really, um, they really helped me with that. Um, you know, there's times when they say stuff that gets to you. Like a couple weeks ago, my son was in my brother's wedding, so we were getting him fitted for a suit, and I sat down on the floor at the store because there was a really, really long line, and he said, "You never sit down." Um, in the store. And I said, well, I really don't feel good right now. And he said, you never feel good. And then that made me feel kind of bad. Like, oh gosh, <laughs> you know, you think sometimes it, they don't notice, but they do, but you know, they're really, they're really great about, they know, you know, when I'm not feeling good, we watch a movie or, you know, they find other things to do to play when I'm not feeling the best. So they're very resilient and I don't really know what else <laughs> to say about it. Um, I've had a really positive experience. I've had a lot of help. My family's been there to help me a lot. Um, friends have been there to help me a lot. So I've been very fortunate in that. Um, you know, when I couldn't do certain things or I had to go to treatment, my husband would take care of them or my parents would take care of them. So yeah, I'm very fortunate for the help for sure. Takes a village. So um Is there anything else you want me to talk about, Holly? Um, no, thank you. Thank you for sharing your journey to motherhood and myositis. We both know how difficult it is to be raising um, babies and toddlers in myositis. So I just wanted to bring your perspective to this webinar to actually be healthy somewhat um, before your diagnosis, because as Dr. Eden said earlier, sometimes pregnancy can trigger myositis. And that might have been your case, I'm not sure, but I did want to let people know that being a mother to an infant is possible in myositis. So thank you for sharing your journey with us today. Yeah, it definitely, um, I had a really bad pregnancy with my daughter and then I got it right after she was born. So they don't know if it triggered it, but it's definitely possible, but no, it's definitely, yeah, it's definitely possible and doable and worth it, so. Well, thank you for joining us today. I know you're in California, so you're on a different time than everyone else, so thank you. Thank you for sharing your journey with us. My right, story, thank oh, thank you. My journey, however, is a little different from Crystal's. I entered my pregnancy with myositis. I was diagnosed at 19 years old in 2003. My CPK count at that time was about 20,000 and it took me a few years to get it low enough to be in remission um, after I got married in 2006 to my husband and we ended up getting pregnant in 2007 at the age of 23. Um, I was considered um, 
like I said, almost in remission by my, my by my rheumatologist. And but at that time there was no true like just knowledge being a small town girl. My rheumatologist didn't really know what to do. So he took me off all of my medications immediately. Um, my medical team at that time only consisted of my OB and him, my rheumatologist. And unfortunately, by the eighth month of my pregnancy, even though I felt fine, my CPK jumped to 5,000. Um, and I developed a chronic cough due to the interstitial lung disease. My pregnancy was full term. I had a natural birth. However, we were shocked to find out that we lost our son due to him being wrapped in the umbilical cord. In 2009, um, I was 25 years old and I was close to being in remission again. <laughs> and I became pregnant with my daughter, Kennedy, who we call our rainbow baby. Um, and I was immediately taken off of medication again, except this time I was left on a low dose of prednisone. I had the same medical team, same rheumatologist, same OB, but this time I was monitored more closely and, um, well, yeah, just basically monitored more closely and, and got more labs usually than what I usually do. Um, during the first trimester, however, I almost miscarried with my daughter and to this day, they don't know why, um, but I was put on strict bed rest. And at 29 weeks, Kennedy was in distress and flatlined twice. Um, while in my stomach. And when she flatlined for the third time, I was put to sleep and had an emergency C-section. She was fully developed, weighing only in at two pounds and had no health issues. I was excited to learn that she could come home when she was four pounds. Um, I wanted to breastfeed and was able to do so for about three months. But unfortunately, my CK numbers went up and I was advised to stop breastfeeding and get back on a, a higher dose of prednisone and get back on methotrexate, things like that. Um, but I was grateful for the experience. Every mother, well, I'm not gonna say every mother, some mothers want the experience of breastfeeding and I was able to do that for the first time with my daughter. Um, I was too young to get a tubal ligation. So my OB advised and placed the IUD in the same doctor visit. <laughs> she was like, you know what, you scared us this time and I really suggest that you get an IUD at least you'll be protected for the next five years and when you come back we'll replace it again or you can get your tubal ligation. Um, I still suffer from the chronic cough and I don't know how or why that never went away but it was really difficult de dealing with that cough and interstitial lung disease. After the five years had passed of being on the IUD um, I of course needed it to get replaced however I became pregnant <laughs> with my third child, Kinsley, um, and I was encouraged to abort her. We had just moved to Houston, Texas, and I did not realize how serious it was to be pregnant in myositis because, like I said, come small town girl, those doctors really did not have like the education, the knowledge to express to me how um, complex my situation is. And once I was out here, I was encouraged by my cardiologist to abort and that I need to make that decision before I was 20 weeks pregnant. Because at that point, they said it was the point of no return. I would have to go through um, the pregnancy. Also, I think they were more um, nervous for me because by that time I had developed pulmonary hypertension. Um, and I was considered, like I said, to be complex and um, high risk with the interstitial lung disease and polymyositis, of course. So that, that year, 2014, at the age of 30, I was unsure what to do. They referred me to a maternal fetal medicine specialist. That was my first time ever hearing that type of specialist before. Um, I only, only knew about OBs and nurse practitioners, pretty much. And so she helped me make the decision by getting together my care team under Baylor College of Medicine. And after doing some testing and review, they felt that I was strong enough to go through with the pregnancy. However, they did all agree that, you know, going through this pregnancy, you will have a poor quality of life coming out. We don't know what that situation will be, but they had everything in place for me, even during the pregnancy to get ready for any, an emergency C-section or, or anything like that and had ICU ready for me, you know, to go for me in case I was gonna be there. Um, but um, as you can see, the only poor quality of life that I have from that pregnancy is being on oxygen. I was put on oxygen during that pregnancy around my six months. So I made it pretty far um, in that pregnancy before I was even placed on oxygen. But it was a little scary because I was advised to put my affairs in order and, 
and, and pretty much get things ready. And the guilt that you feel of being a wife, being a young mother to a five-year-old at that time was, you know, the, you know, am I, am I being selfish? Should I have, should I go through this pregnancy? And um, I'm grateful that I did. I still suffered through the chronic cough, but guess what? I realized that I was developing congestive heart failure and did not know it until 2020 when it really just knocks me down. Um, so that's pretty much my story in a nutshell. Um, I wanted to make sure we stay on course here. There are some questions that need to be answered and I wanna make sure that the audience get the answers that they deserve today. So any questions, you guys? Holly, your story brings, almost brings me to tears. I know, Holly's story is very impressive. I didn't realize how rare it was to be an African-American woman with myositis at a young age to give birth to three children. <laughs> yeah, I didn't, and, and when you started speaking about it, I was like, wait a minute, she went to the list of women who should not have babies? That's me, that interstitial lung disease, pulmonary hypertension. It was like, oh my gosh. Right. And that's why it's always a discussion, right? I mean, so the... I will say I used to have on that slide like contraindications, right? When I was giving it the when I was giving the talk to other medical professionals, and then I realized that I shouldn't say that because that makes it seem like never, and that's not the right way. Again, one thing that I think it is very important to mention is that every every video every case is a case, and that's why it's so crucial to develop a one a good and trustful relationship with your doctors, because this is a decision that we include everyone, we include your doctors, we include your family members, we include other specialists. I even say to my patients that, hey, I know this is not really sexy, but I really need to be the first, one of the first people to know if you want to start to get, you know, the, the plan to get pregnant. And that's important because we can, together, we can really make the difference in planning this the best way possible and trying to make sure that, hey, even if something bad happens, we are ready to act on it and make sure that we can reverse course if necessary. Um, for Dr. Edens, there was a question. Sure. Um, do you usually find that women with myositis have muscles that are actually strong enough for a vaginal birth? Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Ventura's on top of it. She answered the um, question, but I, yeah, I had a vaginal. My, my son was vaginal and then my two daughters were C-section, so I went through both. I think it also depends on, again, like how active your disease is at the time, right? You know, if you're going through a flare at the end of your, at the end of your pregnancy, then, you know, maybe it's not ideal. Um, it's interesting also like what muscles we actually like, like women use to deliver birth. And like a lot of it is like truly like uterus contractions. Um, and so, you know, maybe it's actually less muscle and more uterus that's doing all the job. Um, so uh, I think, um, I think it's always, I think if someone wants to do it, it's always worth a try, right? Again, to me, like the goal is like a healthy mom and a healthy or a safe mom and baby at the end, right? Um, and so if that means that you push for, you know, they let you push for, you know, 24 hours and you're not getting anywhere, then you get a C-section and that was the best thing for you. Um, but I think you sometimes when people, you know, come in with um, preconceived notions and, you know, uh, birth plans that are just unrealistic, um, we can't predict things in medicine as you, you can attest to that, Holly, right? Someone, they told you that you would have all these bad things and nothing, you know, that didn't happen. Um, and so we're not very good at predicting things in medicine. Um, so I think just like being open-minded, same thing to me with, with lactation. To me, you know, it works for some people, it doesn't work for other people. Um, and so we have to be kind of open about those things. Well, um, ladies, as I wrap up this webinar, I just wanna say that I know that um, and understand that I was, wait, I'll wait. Oh, I was, there's some, it looks like there's wait, more. I'll so, wait, cause we were getting ready to. Someone was asking about, um, uh, Ecrolizumab. Oh, it looks like Yasmin answered it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying I to. Agree with, yeah, I would agree with Dr. Ventura's response on that one. Yes, um, yes. Did we talk about reclass? Oh, yeah. Reclass is, a, reclass is challenging. Um, oh, but someone just put something else in the chat. Um, how do you envision the Supreme Court ruling? Oh, so this is really a hot topic. 
So since Friday, well, actually since before Friday, since May when it came out, um, I have been uh, with the other folks who do reproductive health and rheumatology, like trying to figure out what the next steps are. Um, so uh, I think that, yes, the, well, so the problem is poli politicians aren't doctors or medical persons, right? So they don't understand the, the nuances and the differences. Um, Right, they wouldn't understand Holly's story. They wouldn't. They wouldn't get the gravity of having pulmonary hypertension and interstitial lung disease. And uh, so that is where you know, some of the issues are being missed: is understanding how sick our patients can be in the most desired pregnancy. Right? You want like our patients want to have babies. I want them to have babies. Yeah. But like you know, my myositis patients or my scleroderma patients or my lupus patients can unfortunately get really sick even with one, even with like a very wanted baby and planned. Um, and so I think that is where the big, the discourse is um, not understanding those things. Um, so I think unfortunately women are going to suffer um, by not having this safe medical procedure to them. Um, you know, whether you were someone who would proceed with that or not is very different. Um, but I think not having it available to some of the highest risk patients that can possibly get pregnant um, is hard. And I think that the issue is that it's going to have a fallout with other aspects of reproductive health, right? So like, um, is, you know, the IVF community is freaking out because um, they have embryos that are stored in freezers and waiting to be used in the future. And so what's going to happen is like that going to be seen as, um, you know, illegal if I, you know, if I don't use all this embryo or, you know, something like that or like what's gonna to happen to contraception. Like some people think that IUDs, again, like not having the scientific background, politician thinks that, you know, IUDs and the emergency contraception pills, you know, cause um, termination and things like that. They don't, that's not how they work. Um, but my worry is that those things are gonna be restricted to my patients who need them. Um, and, so and exactly because those choices uh, will no longer be available for a enormous amount of women around the country in, in the foreseeable future. This is again, one more argument to please plan your pregnancy. If you are planning to, if you don't want to get pregnant, what are, what are, you, what are you doing to take action to prevent pregnancy to happen? And if you want to get pregnant again, let us know as well. So planning reproductive health, it is really, really important because Again, the possibility of having an abortion if this is an unwanted pregnancy is something that won't be available um, um, for many, many of us in the, in the future. So make sure that you have some, some plan in mind. If it is not getting pregnant or getting pregnant, then the plan is there and you're taking action on it. Well, thank you ladies for this awesome webinar. I have Oh, I have dreamed of this webinar for years, and I'm so grateful that I got to do it with you all. You have inspired me so much in this webinar. And as we close, I just wanted to reiterate how um, fortunate that I was to survive all three of those pregnancies without having the proper information, without having the, the knowledge that Dr. Edens and Dr. Ventura has, you know, given the fact that they probably was still <laughs> working things out in medical school when I, was, <laughs> when, I, when I was pregnant. But I really, really, truly want to thank you, ladies. And I hope that you bless us again by giving us in updated information. I hope that your survey goes well, that people take it and give the proper information for that so that we can get the, the research that we deserve for the women in this community. Thank you, Dr. Ventura, for highlighting the importance of the high mortality rate in African-American women. Um, this webinar is presented by the Women of Color Affinity Group here at the Myositis Association. I'm so proud to be a part of this group of women and we are doing so much to bring so much information about how we are lacking in myositis research. So please, please check us out um, at www.myositis.org for any information, support, or resources that you may need. I, I really don't have any much else to say. And, but and give us feedback as well. If there's any topic on reproductive health and you, you want us to be back and to be more focused, is there anything that is uh, crossing our minds and is generating a lot of discussion? 
Um, it will be the, the greatest pleasure to have Dr. Ines back because she's really yes. a, an expert in the topic and, and hearing her, her talks is always extremely inspiring and she really knows what she's talking about. So if this is another, if reproductive health is something that is making us engage in the discussion and we want to talk more about this, please let us know in the feedback sessions. I, I'll be the first one to say me, especially for men, there's some young men in this community that wants to be fathers and they want to know what will medication do for their health. Yeah. And we don't talk about paternity as much, right? No. Yeah. Right. Men's reproductive health is very overlooked. Um, you know, it's harder to measure. Um, women get pregnant. There's not a lot to measure in outcomes for men, but um, unfortunately a very overlooked topic. Um, but we're, we're trying. Yes. Once again, thank you, ladies. Thank you, thank you to here. everyone who showed up to the webinar tonight. I hope you got the knowledge that you were looking for. And we will see you guys at the next webinar presented from TMA. Bye. Bye. Bye, -bye. Take care. Thank you.